Hello and welcome back. And also welcome to those of you who are joining us via YouTube. If you attended the webinar we delivered last Friday, firstly, thank you and thanks again for joining us today. Much of what I'm about to say mirrors what was said last week. So this mini masterclass is in collaboration with BBC Studios Natural History Unit and delivered by one of their researchers, Chloe Manatsaganyan. And it's part of our plans to launch an emerging talent scheme which sets to improve inclusion and diversity in the natural history industry across the world. We will be empowering the next generation of wildlife filmmakers and conservationists with inclusive mentoring, masterclasses and internship opportunities. This will initially be trialled in Bristol and the UK with a view to making it accessible with our global partners thereby making it a truly international offering. We're doing a number of things to fund the scheme and uh, one of them was through this very t-shirt that I'm wearing. Um, it was available to pre-order until last Sunday and the design was on a limited edition climate neutral earth positive tea. And the sales from the t-shirt will allow Wildscreen to empower emerging talent with free access to their training scheme. The t-shirt was designed by artist Tom Abbas Smith and the artwork on the back, which I will show you now, hopefully you'll be able to see, I'm going on my tiptoes. Um, the artwork on the back highlights two species that have been seriously impacted by climate change and are suffering from severe population decline. They are the lemur frog and the small tortoiseshell butterfly. As of last Thursday, right through to this Thursday, the 29th of April, we are continuing to raise funds via the Big Give so we can develop this world leading programme. The Wild Screen team have been litter picking inland in Bristol last week, yesterday and this morning, having collated almost 3000 pieces of litter so far. Wild Screen interim CEO Sue is challenging herself to complete a 10 mile run around Richmond Park tomorrow. Um, that's going to be in the morning and she'll be running past Sir David Attenborough's house. I did a solo beach clean from 8am until 11am this Sunday where I cleared away 348 bits of litter. This was surveyed and shared with the Marine Conservation Society. And Wild Screen CEO Lucy has completed a 10 mile walk with her son Elwood in tow last Sunday afternoon where Elwood was carried and pushed in his pram along the route. We are accepting donations via the Big Give, who will be match funding our campaign up to two and a half thousand pounds, increasing the impact of the donations received. And one of the Wild Screen team will pop a link in the chat to that. Coming back to today, this mini masterclass will give you a taster of what you can expect to learn by gaining a place on our Emerging Talent Scheme. Please do pop your questions in the Q&A box. We'll also monitor the questions that come in from YouTube too. Please note that I may not be able to ask every single question that comes along in the time that we have available. For now, I will make a start on sharing slides as part of this masterclass and hand you over to the wonderful Chloe Manatsaganyan. Chloe, hello. Hi. Um, it's so lovely to see people from around the world tuning in. Um, thank you so much. I'm glad you can make it. Thank you, Chloe. And thank you for taking the time out to deliver this uh, mini masterclass for our emerging talent audience today. Let me just share the slides and then it will be over to you. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so my name's Chloe um, and I've actually been at the BBC's Natural History Unit for four years now, which is quite wild to think about um, because it's it's absolutely raced by. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, how I got into the BBC and also just my experiences um, on kind of the early stages of my career. Um, I really hope that it's useful um, and yeah, do stick around for the Q&A and hopefully we can answer some of your questions as well and hopefully that's useful too. Um, 
So the first question you've had um, from Wild Screen is, uh, what was it that ignited a passion of the natural world for you? Uh, and for me, this was a really easy question because as soon as I knew nature existed, I wanted to be a part of it. Um, I'm very lucky to have grandparents that live uh, in the southwest countryside in the UK. Um, so I spent a lot of my time outdoors finding slow worms and newts in the garden um, and also just making um, funny videos with, um, with my cousins or with my brother um, and just, just generally being curious about nature. Um, at the time, initially, I thought that I wanted to be a vet, um, but uh, from watching um, documentaries like um, Planet Earth and um, all of today, there's amazing stuff. Um, I realized obviously the natural world is so much bigger than just what's on your doorstep. And it made me feel really curious about studying something that reflected that. So I ended up studying zoology. Um, so the, uh, the second question is, how did you break into the natural history industry? Um, and um, basically when I was at uni, I knew that I wanted to get some industry experience uh, hopefully that was creative and scientific, uh, but I didn't really know what. Um, and it was just from Googling that I came across an amazing organization called Creative Access. Um, and they are an organization that actually helps um, people from underrepresented groups in all types of media um, to find internship positions and just get a foot through the door um, and some experience that they can hopefully uh, take further um, in their career. Um, and it was it was really funny, um, actually stumbling across the, the the advert for a researcher at the Natural History Unit because um, as soon as I saw it, I just felt like I was kind of in a fever dream because I just felt like I had to get it somehow, <laughs> and it became I became an obsession. And I realised, you know, it, it it felt like it fit so much with 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 what I wanted to do that I was kind of I felt like I wish I'd thought of it sooner. Um, but but I, I didn't know what researcher was before then. I didn't even know that role existed. Um, so it was really interesting just to hear that you know the Natural History Unit wanted people like me that are geeky and creative. Um, and so, so I did everything I could to, to get in. Um, and uh, a, a tip for you, if you um, are thinking of applying um, out or trying to kind of um, in, approach employers, um, I tried to think about the present rather than the outcome when it came to interviews, especially, um, because sometimes just, just wanting something to be successful can actually kind of make you more nervous. It can make you more stressed. Uh, and I just kind of thought, you know what, I'm, I'm, I get to go to the BBC today, I've got an interview, I get to speak to world industry leaders and find out more about a job I'm really excited about. And at, at the end of the day, it's just a conversation. Um, so I found uh, that really helped my nerves and it really helped me to, um, to kind of be myself. Um, and that's kind of my other tip as well, uh, when you're talking to employers is to be yourself, but not necessarily just in, in the kind of cheesy sense of it, but in the sense of, you know, you don't have to just be interested in um, wildlife and in kind of photography. You can talk about other interests you have as well. And sometimes they're really transferable. So for example, for me, I love drawing and I never thought I'd be doing drawing for my job, but um, actually storyboards are a really, really useful tool. And um, so I've used drawing a lot uh, that I wouldn't have expected. Um, and also um, before uh, kind of getting into this industry, I did um, some work on summer camps uh, where I had to kind of help with logistics and health and safety. And that's actually a really important part of filming. Um, so do, do talk about your kind of broader experiences as well, because sometimes they can be really transferable. Um, so after I was successful um, in one of the interviews, um, I, I had the opportunity to work on a wild program, um, sorry, live wild program, uh, which is um, Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and Winter Watch. Um, and it was amazing. It was it was such a it was such a rush. Um, but also they had a lot of different roles that you could try, and that was something that was really good about um, that internship. So I got to try running, um, researching, um, and then also they got like a story developing where you get to kind of watch the live cameras um, and 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 basically learning how to do the research, how to have scientific contacts um, that can help you um, and make sure that you've got kind of the most up-to-date um, science in your shows, working with presenters, um, all kinds of all kinds of experiences um, came from that. Um, so the next question is, what were the challenges you had to overcome as an LGBT person of ethnicity? Um, 
And the thing I find interesting about this question when I think about it is I think the biggest barrier for me actually was before I even started at the BBC, before I'd even stepped through the door. Um, and it was really because as much as I adored the shows I was watching um, from the Naturalist Unit, as much as I revered kind of um, Attenborough's work, um, I didn't really see myself uh, on screen. Um, I saw incredibly talented people that looked nothing like me going to corners of the world that I'd never been to. Um, I didn't know anything about media. I didn't know anyone in media. Um, and I didn't know anyone that kind of went abroad to these far flung places. So it really felt very, very far flung from, from kind of my life um, and, and the people I knew. Um, it, kind of, it, felt, it felt kind of very similar to aspiring to be an A-list actor uh, or, or, or to be an astronaut or something like that. So I just, it just didn't, didn't sink in that that could be something I could do. Um, until I saw um, this internship um, scheme and I realised the kind of tangible roles behind the scenes um, that, that looked like what I could do. Um, and, and on the other side, that's more about, that was kind of more about ethnicity, but on the kind of LGBT side, um, when I started um, at the Naturist Unit, I, I did kind of wonder in a professional setting, you know, is it appropriate for me to talk about being LGBT? How is that going to kind of work? Um, but actually very quickly, I realized that um, the BBC already had all kinds of kind of internal networks, including the BBC Pride Network. And I saw a poster for that outside of my office and I realized, okay, you know, this, this is for everyone and, and there are spaces for everyone. And, um, and a real benefit of me coming out at work has been uh, the involvement I've been able to have with um, the um, BBC Diversity and Inclusion Group within Bristol. Um, which, which we've kind of relaunched over the past few years. Um, and, and we've been able to do some really exciting things, not only kind of internal um, kind of groups um, around mental health, around women's um, rights, around LGBTQ issues, um, ethnicity, um, all these different work streams, but also um, we've now um, been able to expand and we've got an outreach coordinator who's going to be going to schools um, and, and, and kind of linking up with organizations um, with it within Bristol and basically making sure that people know the, the Naturalist Unit is for you um, and BBC Bristol is for you. Uh, you don't have to know someone in, in, in media. You don't have to you have a background in media. Um, it's, it's for everyone. Um, and so that's really exciting. And, uh, and this is kind of linking up with um, the BBC's wider plan to have 20% diversity on and off screen, which, um, which is, which is going to cover ethnicity, disability, um, and also socioeconomic background. Um, and so that's, that's something which has been really exciting to be a part of. Um, and, and just in terms of uh, if I was to kind of look back and, and, and give myself a message um, around, around being kind of um, underrepresented in an industry, um, I think what I'd say to myself is like, uh, just because you don't see yourself in the room doesn't mean you don't belong there. And actually it probably means you belong there more because there isn't someone like you there already um, because diversity is strength. Um, when, you're, when you're kind of appealing to diverse audiences, when you're making global content, um, diversity is strength. Um, so, so everyone belongs um, in media and natural history. Um, so the next question is, what is it like working for the BBC? Well, starting off, it's just surreal. It's, it's absolutely surreal because suddenly you're brushing shoulders with, um, you know, the, the industry leaders, um, people that have made content that you've watched and adored. Um, and so you just, you just feel like a flower on the wall and you just want to soak in everything that people's doing um, and, and make sure you're learning as much as possible asking questions uh, and just 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 learning what you can because there's so many skills there's so many roles um, and I remember my first experience on the watches um, uh, with live tv being my first kind of real tv experience and it was it was um, it was absolutely kind of um, ecstatic environment to be a part of um, because uh, you just had everyone running around doing their own thing and um, but, but, it, but it all came together with this well oiled machine and everyone's working so hard and then you just saw kind of the live program go out. Um, so that was a really exciting um, environment to be a part of, um, which I definitely um, won't forget. Um, and then also just kind of more broadly, um, you know, 
the NHU has, you know, made Bristol the centre of um, the centre of natural history globally. Um, and so to be a part of that and to be kind of close to and know people um, who have kind of worked on series like Blue Planet 2 um, that's changed kind of discussions about plastic use um, and, and, and now more kind of um, conservation content coming out with things like Plastic Planet and the watches always do um, great conservation pieces too. Um, it's, it's really great to be so close to um, content that's kind of um, leading some of these discussions and making people think. Um, so I've got a few photos for you of me out and about. Um, so this is the, this first picture is me on the ground getting uh, getting some behind the scenes kind of digital stuff for um, the watches. Um, I can't say I really knew completely what I was doing then. It was early on, but the good thing is that you you do just get to try things um, that you haven't done. You get to try camera gear that you haven't tried. Um, there's a lot of um, training. Um, and it's just, it's just a great, you just, you just want to get stuck in um, and not be too self-conscious about what you're good at and, and what you don't know so much about. Um, and then this other picture here is uh, me uh, directing a shoot uh, with some Conic ponies um, who are really sweet and curious and always got in the way, um, but that was a lot of fun. Um, and then I've got a couple more pictures on the next slide. Um, so that first one is me on the Argentinian coast, um, which was, which is for a series I'm working on now that's going to be going out on BBC America. Um, so that was really exciting. Uh, and then the other picture is uh, me working with a cameraman filming caterpillars with a Lauer probe lens, which is a very cool new bit of kit. Um, and so it, it really is, it really is kind of, you know, you're always, you're always problem solving and you're always innovating and trying to, trying out new equipment and just seeing how it works and stuff. So there really is um, something uh, really, really fun about that. Um, so the next question is, um, what support did you seek and receive? So it goes without saying creative access were a great initial boost um for um for kind of getting support um as well as as well as kind of getting onto production getting that experience um it came with uh, training and master classes and you had your kind of network of other creative access peers um so that was a really um important support um and actually um on the next slide uh, we've got um we've got the the creative access logo um because um the BBC are actually recruiting three new creative access interns um, this year. Um, so that's really exciting. Two of those positions are already live on their website. So go and check those out. And I believe the third one's coming out very soon. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, because, because yeah, it's a really, really great opportunity. I couldn't, I couldn't recommend it enough. Um, and uh, and in terms of just other, other support, um, I'm actually fortunate enough that the BBC um, is, is, is continuing to roll out different opportunities um, in terms of growth and progression. And they've launched um, a new um, assistant producer accelerator scheme, um, actually across the whole BBC, not just within the natural history unit, to kind of help um, train people uh, to get to those, those, those more senior roles ultimately. Um, and I was fortunate enough to secure one of those places. So um, in about a month's time, I'll be starting an AP role on a new production um, and getting some training for a year um, in all sorts like um, directing and edit producing and things like that. So, um, so the BBC has been really, really great in terms of, um, in terms of that kind of support. Um, and the last big, big um, type of support, which kind of leads to the next question actually, is um, mentors. And I, that is, it's something that you can get almost instantly um, because uh, as soon as you know someone who's a few steps ahead of you, they don't have to be, the kind of head of the natural history unit, it can be so, so useful uh, just to have um, that person to help you navigate um, the industry. Um, and it kind of leads into the final question um, that, that we have, which is, why do you think it's important for, um, to support, sorry, emerging talent um, working in the natural history industry? And I think that it's an industry that is so exciting um, and it's very interesting. Um, but it can be quite overwhelming and confusing as well because there's a lot to wrap your head around very, very early on. Um, there's so many different job roles and skills associated with them. 
um, there's specific TV terms, there's the film kit, um, if you're not familiar with kind of um, film kit necessarily, and um, there's the online systems, um, and there's, 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 there's tons to wrap your head around. Um, and it's just really nice having a kind of go-to person who, who, who has been there and who, who's experienced kind of learning um, these things. And, and beyond that as well, um, in terms of um, applying for different opportunities and things like that, knowing how to how to approach um, potential employers or have chats with people within um, within an organization that you're in um, how to craft a CV um, that might be kind of more um, more more kind of creatively minded um, and also and also kind of um, what to expect from like a first meeting um, from from uh, from an employer or, or chatting to someone that you might want to work with um, and I think as well as as well as having mentors to, to, to kind of go to for some of these Things, it's great to uh, actually have a little peer network as well uh, and share experiences and share CVs and, 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 and kind of share, share how things have been working out for you um, because often if you have a question or if, you have, if you're wondering about something it won't just be you um, so peers are really a um, good way to, to kind of support each other um, and the other reason why I think it's important um, to support emerging talent is because we are a global industry um, we're global in the content that we make, and we're global in the audiences that we um, that we're reaching out to, uh, and and that has to be reflected on the other side as well for us to be um, as as successful and make make the best content we can make. So, in terms of supporting um, emerging talent, uh, it, it's really important that everyone has equal access and opportunity to work in an industry, so that we can really kind of reflect the the kind of content and the audiences um, that we have. Um, so that's. That's the end of my talk, but I didn't want to speak for too long because I wanted to get to answer your questions as well. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was amazing and truly insightful. And I'm sure that our audience had really enjoyed listening to, to what you had to say. And um, I, I'd want to tr see what questions have come in. We have had a few yeah. come in now, so I'll start start cracking on with uh, asking those. Um, mm -hmm. I've got some questions too, but I'll I'll, I'll mm -hmm. wait till the end because our audience comes first. <laughs> sure. So um, from a, an anonymous attendee, she they say uh, hi. How important was having a zoology slash biology degree to getting jobs? It seems that many NHU jobs want that even more than being able to demonstrate field experience. That's really interesting you say that. I, I, I assume the question said said NHU versus versus kind of just any wildlife kind of filmmaking um, company because because I, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. I, I, I can understand where that comes from because I think it definitely used to be the case. Um, it used to be very much a prerequisite. Um, but now, now I think most job ads kind of say it's demonstrable experience and passion for the natural world. Um, and I and I personally know people that are very successful within um, within natural history that don't have a zoology degree. In fact, the person that hired me has uh, an English and history degree. Um, so I don't I don't think it is a prerequisite at all. I just think that. It's about talking about your experience. Um, a lot of TV is about experience. If you've been abroad to places, if you've volunteered for wildlife groups, if you've just shown that, that it's something that you're interested about and when you get to interview, it's something that you can talk about with passion. Um, I think maybe a reason why it has been a prerequisite in the past is because often you're talking to scientific contacts and they might be talking in quite sciencey language that you then have to kind of be that middle person to Get it to something that you know an audience could understand um but if you're already kind of interested in science and uh, and taking on scientific content um then I, I i don't see that as 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 a reason not to you just have to show that you that you love nature it's not about having a degree thank you chloe um we've got two time? we've got two questions that are quite similar so i'm um I'm, I'm, I'm just going to kind of actually three questions that are quite mm. similar. So I'm just going to round all of them up into the into the same question. And um, it's along the lines of what would be the best way um, to obtain a, a, a position at the BBC if you're based in another country? Um, 
and it and does does the studio prefer hiring locally now i'm i'm pretty sure that's not the case but um if you're if you're able to kind of give some insights into that that'd be great mm, that's a very it's a very good question because i actually have heard of um other natural history programs um hiring people abroad more so than teams i've worked on but that's that's because i've worked on a lot of wild, wildlife stuff in the uk <laughs> so that's probably why um for me but um but but the thing the thing that i would say is that um that there are loads of different roles that we work with internationally anyway it's often they're different roles so a big one is uh, location manager um and often that's um that's working not just that's not kind of just working with the bbc it's actually working um on all kinds of shoots with different um with different people um, and different organisations um, that, 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 um, that are filming wildlife. Um, but we, we rely on, on location managers globally all, all the time that, that know the best places um, to, to observe certain wildlife that, that help with permits. Um, sometimes they are very, very specialist in, in, in the wildlife themselves and they, they really kind of do the whole thing. Other times it's more about the logistics than it is about the wildlife. Um, so that really does vary. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would definitely hope that, that because of kind of how, how we've seen how we can work remotely, even within the UK, um, that it's something that's just going to happen more. And I would say that there has been a lot more remote shoots happening for obvious reasons with COVID and seeing the success of that and then also seeing how it's so much better for the environment. Uh, there's so many reasons for things to go more that way. Um, so I definitely wouldn't wouldn't let wouldn't um wouldn't let that put you off um just because things have been more centralized in um the uk um because because i think i think it's just gonna it's just gonna expand um more and more based on the kind of ways we've been working um under covid so and if you don't ask you don't know <laughs> so um so definitely better to 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 ask and to apply and to just actually see what happens i think that's brilliant advice, Chloe. And actually, um, I follow Dan O'Neill on Instagram. And if you had joined us on Friday, he was part of the panel. And over the weekend, I saw in one of his stories how he had, was approached by a young woman in a cafe who had seen all of their filming, quick, uh, filming equipment and mm. asked them what they were doing. And she said, I'm a filmmaker as well here in, in Kurdistan, which is where they were filming. And then it turned out that actually they needed some translation services and cool. they got in touch with her. They exchanged contact details and they said, we, we need translation services. We met you in this cafe. Can you help us? And the BBC contracted her to um, deliver translation services. Now, it's not the filmmaking mm. that she wants to do, but it's a step in the in the in the industry, a foot in the door. And when the BBC wants to go and film in Kurdistan again. That she she's going to be front of mind so um mm -hmm. I, I think that having seen that on on dan's instagram was really inspiring actually um i've got a, a a question here from a photographer and i'm going to ask this because of the the watches they are they often show photos don't they um of wildlife and it's not mm -hmm. purely about the, the the cameras um in in some of the programs more so in the um in the after show um, rather than in the main show. Um, but the, this person is asking where would they, uh, for wildlife ph photographers, where would you recommend that they, they look for, for opportunities? I'm guessing that's in context of maybe the BBC using images. I'm not sure. They've not expanded uh, on that, but. Okay. Um, I guess I'll try and ask answer in both ways. Um... Yeah, that's, that's interesting in terms of if it depends if you're talking about exclusively being a photographer or if you're talking about branching into wildlife filmmaking. If I assume the latter, that the immediate thing that comes to mind um, that, that I've personally worked with local photographers in the UK at least on is um, time lapse. Time lapse is a big, big, big uh, tool that's been used. Um, we're, 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 we're basically just constantly trying to push different ways to tell stories and um, to reveal things. So that, that was basically like a, a project that I worked on, all was about revealing changes that you might not see in real time. And then suddenly um, you get to see this, these kind of amazing wildflower meadows, or you get to see amazing floods rise up or something like that. And we actually worked with a lot of photographers rather than cinematographers 
um, to, to, to achieve that. Um, because the good thing is that if you are in a local place and you know the weather and you know how things are changing, um, then you can then you can basically be out in a reactive way that a kind of traditional shoot might not be able to. So we actually contracted some very talented local photographers to, to go out when they saw best and to be reactive to storms, to like amazing clouds, to all of these kind of things. And then to actually um, tell tell these stories and get these amazing shots that were really um, integral to that to that shoot. So in, if you're looking in terms of a segue between photography into cinematography, time lapse is a really useful tool to have um, that, that a lot of camera operators operators sorry are you uh, are looking to get so that might be a nice um, a nice segue for you um if you're talking about um yeah like photography opportunities in general i think i think it's i think it is more kind of submitting submitting things to, to programs um but but yeah yeah i'm not sure i'm, I'm not sure exactly if that's what you meant yeah i i was just going to uh, going to add to that that the the bbc have kind of commercial arms and there's a there's a BBC wildlife magazine mm. um that you you could get in touch with and um I'll I'll see if I whilst you, you're answering the next question I'll see if I can quickly find a link mm. for that online where we can share in the chat um but that Absolutely. that might be something to to consider as well the next question we have is from um Dorward or Darwood Qureshi, who I know attended the webinar on Friday. So I, I really hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, they are saying, just saying it's absolutely incredible hearing from someone who's uh, queer and uh, of ethnicity. It's so empowering. I never thought I'd see this. So thank you. What would be your advice for crafting a cover letter for the Creative Access Scheme and BBC Traineeship? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, well, first, uh, yeah, no, it's it's so cool to to think that you can be um, queer of ethnicity within the industry and just see yourself. Um, so yeah, so that that's awesome um, that you that you feel welcome um, because you should. Um, and yeah, um, in terms of crafting, um, I I think the thing which I which I try and think about that is. Um, maybe slightly different is that I think creative industry, they want to know you a little bit more uh, than maybe some more kind of corporate role. Um, so I would say, especially in a cover letter, you do want to kind of show show some of your excitement, show some of your interests. I, I try to bring my personality into it. And and also the other side is that, um, you know, often, often these things are very high pressured uh, in terms of being out in the field, getting, um, getting these shots and stuff. Um, so having someone that's kind of level-headed, that's that, 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 that's kind of up for for being involved, um, and and that kind of isn't isn't afraid of of trying, um, and having having just a generally a positive attitude, I think is a really big deal. And I think it's why uh, people love to meet people first and to get an idea of your personality as well. So I, I would say personality is is really quite a big. Um, a big thing um yeah de definitely just 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 be yourself and yeah the other thing i would say is that um yeah talk 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 about talk about different elements that you're creative um and it doesn't have to be immediately media minded so you know i, I was doing a bit of photography i was, I was making a, a few videos but i was also writing stories and, and drawing like i was saying so I, I mentioned all of these things because because I think it's more about having an interest and actually you know we are storytellers so even though writing a story might not seem immediately relevant um try and be creative at seeing things that could actually segue in and and, and, and just demonstrate that you're keen um and, and that, that you're kind of um thinking thinking about things that that could be actually really relevant in the UK there is an organization called screen skills and they really offer some fantastic tips and advice around job applications and, and uh, how to prepare for interviews and so forth. Um, so do check them out. Again, I'll find out a link whilst Chloe's uh, answering the, the next question and I'll pop that in the chat. Um, that, that would be the, the best place to, to start and look. Oh, and also utilizing creative uh, access because I know that they will be open to um, receiving yeah. questions and, and uh, around that too. Absolutely. Something else which um, which which I was thinking about um, is that um, within within um, the digital content, they are making content um, in BBC Digital 
natural history um, around the world doing exactly this. So they're just launching um, a program that um, that basically interviews people in their home country and tells a story of their their intimate um, experiences with wildlife. So that is to some extent already happening. Um, and and again, I think it's I think it's happening more so because of um, because of COVID, um, because you've had to think of creative ways. Um, I think it's called Planet Protectors. I was just I was just trying to think if it was Planet Protectors or Planet Defenders, but it's um, I think it's Planet Protectors, um, and and we have like an in-country um, in the UK uh, presenter that then interviews um, people around the world um, and their stories. So it's definitely things that the that, that Naturalist Unit are interested in. Um, so I, I would say absolutely that's possible. Um, it's just finding the right person to speak to um, about that. Yes, yeah, thank you for that. Um, and the next person has said, uh, love this chat, Chloe. How can I get the correct experience to become a researcher for the BBC NHU? Um, I've, I've been told I don't have enough experience, but don't know how to get it. Well, I think the uh, creative access training opportunity um, is, is the best way to, to go for that. And I mean, I know that that is specifically towards um, applicants who are ethnically diverse. So I, I'm, I'm afraid I don't know um, what, what your heritage is or background, but just generally speaking, if they're not applicable to apply for that, Chloe, what advice can you give specifically around that? Okay, so a few things. So you mentioned skills, um, Screen Skills, which is a great, um, a great organisation. Um, they constantly have um, kind of different masterclasses and and talks um, that they're running all the time. Um, so that's a really good place to look. Screen Skills. Um, another thing is that uh, the BBC do run other schemes like the Apprenticeship Scheme, which is specifically for people that don't have a degree. Um, I'm not sure when those are coming out now I'm thinking about it, but that is that is another scheme that, that does exist. Um, people that I know that, um, that haven't come in on schemes often have just worked in a different type of, um, of media. Um, and that's a really good way. So for example, you can say, I want to be a natural history researcher. Maybe, maybe you have you know, grounding in natural history, but not really any media experience. I, I know people that have, been runners on programs like um, Channel Four um, programs, or or even or even I know someone who had who happened to have a feature film, a smaller feature film happening in their hometown, and they just asked, "Can I be a runner on this show?" Um, and it's really just trying to get yourself just into the environment of of kind of on location for TV or film, learning what the roles are, um, and it doesn't have to be like long long gigs. In, in each place or anything like that but if you can just find kind of an initial running role um then that then that's a way to say you know i have been on location i understand what it's like to work with different types of people to work with cameramen to work with either actors or presenters or, or all sorts so I, I do think that a lot of people because natural history can be quite niche um, i do think a lot of people do get um, on location filming experience to some extent in in in, in other kind of um completely different types of um, TV or film. Um, I, I hope that helps, but that's definitely, and then, but, but then the other thing, sorry, I should say actually, is that often we get told, you know, you, you, can, you can do some of these things yourself as well. I know that sometimes it's, it, it's, it's budget restrictive, but if you have uh, any kind of camera, if you have friends that have cameras, you can come together and make your own projects as well. And I think I didn't really have much media experience myself, but I did make my own things uh, when I was interested. So just trying to think of the tools you might have right now uh, and the things that you might be able to do just off your own back um, might be might be another um, really useful um, way to kind of get more experience. And um, there's loads of loads of tutorials on YouTube about how to use every camera. Um, uh, so so yeah, definitely um, go hunting for some of those as well. Somebody has asked a, a really good one here. Is it possible for someone who is already a camera person to get this position? Um, if not, how can someone become a wildlife camera person, even as an assistant? Because I think sometimes there is, with, with researcher roles, 
um, you kind of going into assistant producing. And I know that traditionally in the past, the, when you kind of go down that route, you're not always um, doing camera work, are you? But some some people do. So I think it depends on what where your interests lie and how much you want to do it, I guess. Yeah, 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 that's true. I mean, I mean, the, 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 there's a bit to say because I'm not sure if they're saying that they're interested in the research side as well, but that that's perfectly valid. And actually, there are different kinds of productions um, that, that need different types of people. So I know personally, uh, there are some productions that um, there's like a camera bursary scheme where people will come on for a year to production and they will be the second camera on as many shoots as possible. And that's much more camera focused. Whereas I also know productions that have hired specifically looking for a researcher minded person that can that can operate a camera and do some behind the scenes stuff. And so it's more of a shooting researcher role and th those roles do exist. Um, they, they definitely do exist. So sometimes they're actually looking for that combination of strength. So if you're just asking if it's possible, it definitely is possible. Um, yeah, absolutely. Basically, the, the Emerging Talent Scheme, we've recognised the need for um, helping those uh, to, to break into the industry because of COVID and limited access to equipment and so forth as a result. Mm. And somebody has asked, um, do you have any, this is from Alicia, do you have any advice on breaking into the natural history and conservation industry if you're someone that is interested in changing careers? Uh, which I think is a good point because many people will have... Um, been impacted by mm. COVID through redundancies and perhaps this would be a, a great time to to change tack yeah. I'm guessing it's just reiterating everything that you've said so far yeah I would say I mean yeah there, there's nothing there's nothing to stop you I know people who have you know who have, who have changed careers and gone into natural history you know you don't have to have uh, you know you do get that story I mean I know that I've loved nature from the beginning but you also get the story of sometimes people know that they want to be a well, a cameraman from the time they pick up a camera and film a butterfly and that definitely wasn't that definitely wasn't me you know the penny didn't drop until after I was doing my degree so and I know people who have you know who have gone and done all sorts and then and then decided that they wanted to get into um to wildlife so it's definitely possible um yeah kind of reiterating what I was saying is just I would really think about the kind of experience that you can bring from whatever your previous position was uh, any anything that could be transferable so it's, it's really easy sometimes to just think of science and creativity but actually remember there's a whole logistical side behind that um, in terms of safety in terms of like management so if you've planned trips for people if you've been responsible with safety uh, or if you've had to like write write kind of reports or just just things like that that um, kind of um, just try and try and think of the skills that you might have and try and kind of and, and look at the job descriptions. Um, that, that's something which I do all the time is, you know, look, look at jobs, even jobs that are a bit too experienced for you and just see what are they actually looking for. And then line up with your experience and see how you can kind of marry them together. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna just ask one more question because I am conscious mm. of time. So this will be the last question that we, we ask today. And um, it's from Sonakshi and they ask, I wonder if knowing languages is an advantage in the industry? I would say so, wouldn't you? Absolutely. I, I do not know um, other languages, Sally, but I, I know researchers who, yeah, who, who have been able to use that um, absolutely. And, and sometimes it will even dictate um, what, what program you might be on in a series or something like that. Um, there have absolutely been times where um, someone might only, you know, they might they might not be that strong in their English. And actually, when you think about um, the kind of things that you'd be talking about can be quite specific, can be quite scientific. So you don't, and then there's a lot of things that are really important to get right that you wouldn't want to be lost in translation. Um, there are people always, always emailing around the loop, the unit saying, is, is, do we have a German speaker that could translate this email for us? So it's always a good thing and definitely highlight it on your CV, all the languages that you can speak. Thank you for that. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there with the questions. I'm sorry I've not been able to answer every single one of them. Um, but we we have gone over time for this. What um I just wanted to reiterate is that I have put some links in the chat, one for screen skills, one um, in response to the person that asked about the photography, the BBC Wildlife magazine link is in there as well. And um and thank you, Chloe, for That's all right. your time today. It's been um, really brilliant. It's such a brilliant mini masterclass. The audience have clearly loved it. I've 
I've just seen a, a message come through to us. This has been so great. Thank you. Um, and, you know, thank you for sharing your time with us today. No worries um, at all. And good luck to everyone. And maybe I'll see you on Instagram or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. And I hope to see some of you in the BBC at some point. It'd be great. <laughs>